adjustments to the agenda? I guess the only question I would pose is with some of the way the uh, Act 127 is being pretty fluid. Would it would it be appropriate for us to discuss some updates before we go over the budget, or do you want to? I think it has it. It's in this whole presentation. Even whatever is happening. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. So we don't have any adjustments. Just need a motion to approve. So moved. Okay. It's moved. Second. Second. Any further discussion on it? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Rodney, good? Yep. Aye. Aye. Okay. All right, we have uh, board comment. Is there anything the board would like to bring up that's maybe not uh, budget related? Okay, hearing none, close that. And we're on to the informational meeting with the budget. Just quick intros, maybe? Sure, yeah, if you want. Um, just the intros of people that's here? Yeah. Yeah, so we have we have all, uh, I didn't see Peggy jump on yet. Uh, we have all the board members in attendance except for Peggy, so Andrew, Chris, um, Ed, Rodney, Nancy. And on the administration end of things, uh, we have Jamie and Tara, Jeff, here, and <coughs> I don't know. Anda's not here. Anda's not here. Nope. Okay. So the presentation that we have, we're going to go over, is on the fiscal year 2024-2025 budget. So what does the 24-25 budget support? It supports the current staffing that we have in our buildings, an increase of 1.0 to provide middle and high school tech education, a 0.4 FT increase to the reading and math interventionist, and this will allow um, the ability to assign a 1.0 math interventionist to the middle school. We've added a 1.0 FTE social worker to provide wraparound support services for students and families. We've also added a 1.0 FTE student support coordinator for the elementary campus and a 1.0 FTE administrative assistant to the guidance department. We have a one-time purchase of classroom instructional materials and then the annual contract for student transportation services provided by Tri-Valley Transit which allows students to access after school programming and uh, provide additional opportunities for transportation for tuition and students coming into Wright River Unified District. And what are the costs allocated to these changes in the budget? The new positions are $434,914, one-time spending of $51,400, and then the overall budget increase on the line items um, for health insurance, salaries, uh, increase in supplies, cost for utilities, all of those other lines in the budget was $927,264 for an overall increase of $1,413,578. So those of you that are following along in your books, if you have your annual meeting books with you, um, this is a summary of the tax sheet. So the budget overview and change from fiscal year 24 to fiscal year 25, again, that increase is $1,413,578 or 10.9%. We have a reduction in local revenue of $9,151 or 0.7%. Act 68 education spending equals an increase of $1,422,729. And just a reminder of what that is, that's what we actually collect from the education fund. So new this year, which we're going to get into in the following slides, is our long-term weighted average. This used to be known as our equalized pupil. So for RUD, um, the new increase in 2024 versus where we are in 2025, gave us an increase in our long-term weighted average of 64.74. So we take the Act 68 education spending, we divide that by the long-term weighted average, 
and that gives us our per pupil spending of $11,950.42, which is an increase of $629.74 over the current fiscal year. Uh, so just a, a little bit of a review for folks, and you've been reading it in your papers uh, uh, quite a bit um, in regards to Montpelier and uh, changes that occurred back in 2022 uh, to how we fund education, and that act was Act 127. And it, it was an act committed to improving equity across Vermont schools by adjusting the school funding formula. And in White River Unified District, the new weights, um, as compared to the old weights, did provide for greater tax capacity. Um, and we're going to get into showing you how that played out because your equalized tax rate actually is going to go down. What's contributing to your overall increase in taxes is a decrease in the common level of assessment. And so we're going to break you, walk you through all that here later in the presentation. But in general... The new weights uh, accounted for things that they didn't in the past. One is that it provided greater weight now for middle school students as compared to previously, acknowledging that students in middle and high school uh, tend to cost more for us to educate. Um, two, it now provided additional weights for students who would have uh, qualified for free and reduced lunch. And in White River Unified District, we are well over 60% in free and reduced lunch percentages now, um, K through 12. Um, and so that increased our pupil count. Uh, students that are served um, that English is their second language now count for about two and a half uh, students as compared to prior. And there's also some um, weights that occurred in regards to population density across the state that uh, school districts and rural communities also gain some additional tax capacity, acknowledging that, um, that there are some, some things, challenges in more rural area communities um, in regards to the cost of education. And so in general, White River Unified District gained um, some pretty good tax capacity due to Act 127. Uh, the next slide talks about some other provisions that were provided via Act 127. That's, that's what you've really been reading about. And so to limit the tax rate increases for districts losing tax capacity as a, revolt, a result of Act 127, they provided a five-year provision in Act 127 that would result in if a district spent less than 10% in spending a per-pupil difference between FY24 and FY25, that their equalized tax rate would be capped at 5%. What the legislature realized fairly quickly in this new term is that due to that provision, what it was resulting in is that the Ed Fund was going to have a shortfall because if a district is spending well over their 5% equalized tax rate cap, that money has to come from somewhere. And a reminder that it's a statewide Ed fund. So if a district's only paying 5% of an equalized tax rate cap, but they may actually be, be spending on the upwards of 8%, that 3% difference is made up across the rest of the remaining districts that haven't hit the cap. And the way it's made up is an adjustment of the yield, which we'll get into here in a minute. That is the real lever that the state has to generate more revenue into the Ed fund. The more the yield drops, the more everyone else's tax rate that wasn't um, already at the 5% cap goes up, okay? And at White River Unified District, we're actually three cents under your equalized tax rate. So there was a lot of room there that they could have still dropped the yield and it would have contributed to increased taxes for you based on nothing being done here locally in your district. There is now a bill that's been introduced. It's called H850. Um, and that bill is being reworked to remove the cap and to provide some other um, transitional incentives around uh, tax decreases for districts that lost capacity. 
and uh, it waits to be seen, but we anticipate that some um, some version of H H H eight fifty will pass and be signed into law here in the next couple weeks. Did it get out of the appropriations committee? Like yes. It yeah, it went to the house floor yesterday. Okay. Um, so I'm going to hand it. As far as Act one twenty seven two, for those that are on, know that um, it's complicated. Please feel free to reach out to uh, one of your board members and or central office, um, and we're more than happy to walk folks through it. But in general, the thing to know is that under Act 127, there were definitely – we gained pupils. It's a good thing for White River Unified District. Your equalized tax rate's actually down, and we'll walk you through that here in a, in a moment. So the slide that's on the screen now are actually the impact of Act 127 for Wright River Unified District. So the fiscal year long-term weighted average for 24 was that 1,30.68 that I showed you on a couple of slides ago in comparison to what your equalized pupil was, which was 566.94. So that's that tax capacity that Jamie's referring to. And then your fiscal year 25 long-term weighted average again is that 1,095.42 that we showed on the prior slide. So this is just a quick remembrance on how we actually get to your tax rate. So in the previous slides, I showed you what our expenditure budget was, subtracted out our local revenue, and that gave us our Act 68 education spending. We divide that by the equalized pupil, now the long-term weighted average, and that gives us our per-pupil spending. So once we get that per-pupil spending, we then divide the per-pupil spending by the yield, and that gives us the district-wide equalized tax rate. Once we get the district-wide equalized tax rate, that's then divided by the common level appraisal for each individual town, and that gives you the projected tax rate that's going to be on your property tax bill. So what is the yield? The yield is the factor that's used to convert your per-pupil spending and your equalized tax rate. It's adjusted depending on how much the state needs to collect via property taxes to, fun to fund the Ed Fund, as Jamie just mentioned. The projected yield we get um, initially is provided by the tax department, and we get it on or around December 1st each fiscal year for the following fiscal year. In January, we were notified um, after some recalculations of the Ed Fund that the yield projection was actually going to be lower than what was provided in the December 1st letter, which is that 9,171 is the yield that's also used in your budget presentations throughout your annual mailer. In February, we since received an additional projected possible scenario of the yield. So last week, actually, we, we were provided one that had a slightly higher yield, brought it up to 9,000. $679, which will show what that means in the following slides. The final actual yield is set by the legislature as they get closer to the close of the session. So we don't normally know the final yield until May, sometimes early June. So this slide here shows the implications of the fluctuating yield. So again, you know, different scenarios. We have three different yields currently on the table with a fourth one potentially more still out there. So again, you take your per pupil spending, you divide it by your yield, and that gives us our equalized tax rate. So the current projected per pupil spending in your budget mailer is that 11,950.42, and that current yield at that time was 9,171, gives you an equalized tax rate of 1.3031, and then we show you what your fiscal year 24 equalized tax rate is. So going down that slide, the December 1st yield was 9,452, and that gave us an equalized tax rate of 1.2643, which is actually a reduction of 7.47 cents. The January revised yield was 9,171. Again, that's what's in your mailer. Gave us an equalized tax rate of 1.3031, a reduction of 3.08 cents. And then using that potential yield um, that we received last week of that 9,679 would give RUD a projected equalized tax rate of 1.2347, which is actually a reduction of 9.92 cents. And then whatever the final yield may be. 
just to chime in real quick, um, you can see with how different those scenarios are, like it was a challenge doing the budget piece this year because you know we, we try and do what we can to keep taxes down and you know make them try and keep them as level as possible while also providing the resources that the school needs. And it's difficult when you have these changing scenarios. And so, you know, this really was a challenging season because it was very uncertain as to what kind of the results of what we were doing was going to be. So, so based on the February, the last February projection, if the revision to Act 127 goes through, what are we thinking that that change may be from the February projection? <coughs> So they were counting on that change going through. So that, that is projection. if that goes through. Yeah. Okay. And um, just to clarify for folks, why would that go? Why does that change? They're expecting but uh, districts to amend their budgets and decrease spending due to the cap being removed. And so if there's less um, spending and the fact that all local districts would actually be paying taxes up to the rate that they spent, not capped. There's not as much of a budget shortfall for the Ed Fund to have to make up. My sense is that it's going to be somewhere between that 9452 number and the 9679 number. I'll go on the record of that and we'll see where it plays out by the way. I wouldn't bet on that, but, <laughs> but I, my sense is it might be between there. So. So the next factor, again, so once we get that equalized tax rate for the district, we then go to the individual towns, and we take that equalized tax rate and we divide it by the town's common level of appraisal, and that gives us the projected tax rate on your property tax bill. So as you can see, in both of our towns, we've had substantial decreases in the common level of appraisal dating back to the fiscal year of 21. For this current fiscal year, you are at 88.40% in Bethel and 85.44% in Royalton. The, the common level appraisal for fiscal year 25 dropped to 79.77 in Bethel and 79.44 in Royalton. So the two tax rates that are shown there are using both of the yields that we just looked at at the next slide. So potentially on the Bethel, your tax rate could be between 1.6335 or 1.5478, and then in Royalton, 1.6403 or 1.5442. And we go into further detail in some of the following slides. So this is just a different view of the decline in the common level of appraisal going back to the 1819 fiscal year. So this slide here is going over the summary and implications of the changes for both the January yield, that $9,171 that's in your budget mailers, versus that $9,679 um, projected yield for February. So again, the change in the per pupil spending that we reviewed a couple slides back was $629.74. The equalized tax rate, depending on which yield we move forward with, is a reduction of 3.08 cents for the January yield and 9.92 cents for the February yield, which gives you a final tax rate in Bethel um, change of 12.46 cents using the January yield or 3.89 cents using the February yield. And in Royalton, the change in the final tax rate in using the January yield is 7.91 cents or a reduction of 0.07 cents for the February yield. So then down below, we've provided um, a potential dollar amount to each of those cents um, based on 100,000, 250,000, and the $500,000 home. Again, the yellow are the Bethel and Royalton using the January yield, and the green is the Bethel and Royalton using the February yields. Yeah, so we've just tried to broke break down for folks, like locally, what's actually in the school district board's control versus what's provided and or dictated uh, due to the statewide ed fund. 
And so you can say, see, really, the general budget for us in our local revenues, that, that's really what's in our control, okay? The other big factors, though, that contribute to the tax rate are the calculations made via the long-term weighted average daily membership um, that occurred via Act 127. The property dollar yield is a huge one. And a, a reminder that that is not set by the legislature until May, typically. Okay? And then, finally, that common level of appraisal. So, I, I hope as we've gone through this, one of the things I want to really leave folks is, is that Act 127, the yield, our local education spending, um, in all those scenarios we provided, though, is actually a decrease on the tax rate. What any increase that you're seeing in your taxes this year at this district are all contributed due to the significant drop in the common level of appraisal that we saw. And a reminder that the common level of appraisal is really about what our, our home values are valued at, assessed at currently, versus what the state is saying that they would actually be valued at on the market. And it's the adjustment that the state makes in order to make certain everyone's paying what they see as their fair share of taxes into the ed fund. And it's, it's also on a three-year average. So yes. the challenges we have is, um, so right now the averages are being used over at 21, 22, 23. Um, most of the movement in the real estate market happened majorly in 22 and 23. 21 was actually a stable year. So the challenge we have, not just this year, but we're going to have it again next year, is that we're going to lose our one stable year next year. So 21 is going away. So we have 22 and 23, which are unstable. And then what brings the market this year? So there's likely going to be more adjustment downward, unfortunately. Not to be the bearer of the bad news, but just being realist of the common level appraisal. And the only way that's going to get back to zero is, um, well, Bethel is already in the process of doing reassessments. So probably many of you have been contacted already by the person to come out this year and reassess your property. So um, kind of kind of resets the... Um, um, the local market, and then Royalton isn't currently in the process of that. Now, uh, because typically you have triggers, so um, if it goes over 110% or if it dips below 85%, it's usually a trigger to reappraise. Uh, but it happens so fast in a year and a half process, and these reappraisal processes take years. They're not, it's not a next year we'll do it. Um, so like, for instance, for Bethel, we started the reappraisal process two years ago of line, you know, moving forward, lining somebody up <coughs> to come and do it. They have a long list of lots of people. So, and we're just starting ours this year, which will go this year and next year. So Bethel will still be in the reappraisal process into next year. So we won't be able to use any reset. So you're gonna be waiting until 2025, you know, to be able to get that. Now, Royalton has changed so drastically and they hadn't started the process that they're probably going to be starting the process, which means you're a couple years out on that. Um, and then the, um, I don't know what the act was, but the uh, Montpelier had had set foot um, stricter parameters for reappraisal uh, triggering that will happen every six to seven years now, uh, rather than be a benchmark. So um, so those are some of the things that's coming down. But like, like Jamie said, if you take what we can control the budget, the, the budget really was going to be a seven cent savings. Um, we actually talked at the board about taking five of those cents and put them away for a rainy day or, or using them towards infrastructure and still giving a savings of two. And then the common level of appraisal just kind of blew up. So um, so now we're, we're left scrambling. Um, now, regardless of what happens here, I mean, if we get stuck with the higher amount, we still have to put it in perspective that our district is in a way better position than most of the other districts. I mean, uh, you know, in Bethel, if it did go up 12 cents, there's districts that are talking 20 and 30, and I even heard a 40 cent district. So there, there's lots of movement on that. Um, All right, thank you. 
So the rest of these slides are going over the other articles on our annual warning, um, just to kind of give a heads up what they each mean. Article one is to elect a moderator. Article two is to elect the school district clerk. Article three is to elect the school district treasurer. Article four is to hear and act upon the school district officer's reports, which will be a presentation much more detailed than this one. Um, article five is to set your school district officer salary. And then Article 6 is to set your school district treasurer's salary. And then Article 7 is the our tax anticipation note article, which allows the district to borrow money in anticipation of revenue coming in from taxes and from the three payments that we get each year from the Ed Fund. Article 8 is our actual budget article. So that's the article is currently reading, shall the voters of the school district approve the school board to expend $14,382,093 which is the amount the school board has determined to be necessary for the ensuing fiscal year. It is estimated that this proposed budget, if approved, will result in education spending of $11,950.42 per equalized pupil. Article 9 is our article to the voters asking them to allow us to transfer the $900,000 um, projected from our fiscal year 23 surplus of $997,660 to the White River Unified uh, District Capital Improvement and Maintenance of Facilities Fund, and that's what we've done with our surplus for the last couple of years um, to get that set aside for our future capital improvements, which are highlighted um, in the next and another couple slides. So this gives us a current projection of the capital projects reserve fund. So at the close of fiscal year 23, that balance was $1,441,810. Board approved us to utilize $181,262.50 for the EEI projects that had happened um, this last year at both campuses. In the fiscal year 25 budget, if that budget is approved, there is a $40,000 transfer built into that budget. And then if Article 9 is approved, that gives us that extra $900,000. So the proposed fund balance um, at the beginning of fiscal year 25 would be $2,200,547.50. And then this slide here is uh, some of the work that is in the pipeline for White River Unified District. Chris, do you want to go over that slide? <clears throat> do you want me to? Um, I can go over that. I think the other thing that might be pertinent to talk about is is kind of how how yes, have we you. come up with this um, uh, balance uh, left over? And because I think the common information that I'm getting from people is well. They're sandbagging their budgets, and they got, <coughs> you know, $800,000, $900,000 that they could have, you know, could have taken out of their budget and made the, the, tax, rate, the tax rate less. So, so the, the biggest things that the movers of the reason why a majority of that money is, is available to us is, well, two things. We, we've had a lot of COVID money that's been injected into the state, and there's opportunities to use that COVID money. Um, some people decided to add amenities, build on things that they have that would be sustainable things, like, like you know, hiring on, um, going different ways where you're going to have it in your budget for many years. We have taken more of an approach of let's do one-time things, um, not things that we're going to have to pay on over and over and over. And we've been using that money to, um, to <coughs> we have been using that money to fund places that we typically would fund but we've been using that money. And then instead of us funding that, that mechanism, we've been taking that money and saving it. So now, for anybody that's followed the school board in the last you know, half a dozen years is, you know, we, we didn't have any money years ago. So you know, we were always in negative draw, going back to the voters and saying, I'm sorry, but we're gonna need another $400,000 this year. And, and you know, Lisa's here, so she knows all about that. You know, we've had to do that, and it was really rough back then. Now we have very responsible budgets, and and we've acted on those budgets responsibly, and we have not taken this one-time carrot of money from the feds, and went and just went on a spending spree with this thing that's going to um, pay for you know we'll be paying for years. So we've we've decided to reasonably let's save this money, and let's put money into our schools that we all know needs needs work. So we have started that as you saw, um, some of the work that we did do this year. 
and, and again, we're being careful with our money. We're not just going to say, hey, we got $2 million, let's see what we can buy. We're seeing how, how can we leverage that money. Um, a lot of the, the infrastructure work we did this year, um, there was grants, there was, um, there was education money linked to that. Um, a lot of it is um, like um, net zero. So anything that we put into something, we're gonna get back over a short period of time. Um, so we just did, what was the total amount of the projects? 1.6 and change. 1.6 of which we, million. of which we contribute 181,000. So that, you know, those are good, you know, good match dollars. Um, and we have a list of, uh, as anybody that's been in the schools, there's, there's quite the list, but we, you know, we're working on, it. we can't write the ship in one day, but we can build on. Uh, one thing, uh, somebody had talked to me like, oh, you guys are going to have $2 million in the bank. And I said, well, put it in this perspective. Woodstock right now is thinking about putting a $99 million new school. So $2 million versus $99 million is not really a lot of money, right? I mean, if you think about everything that you need to do. Um, so some of the things that we are looking on um, that we will um, <coughs> looking for is we're going to be putting forward a, a bond vote in November. Um, so we're pretty excited that um, we're looking at upgrading. Well, we have established as a board that, you know, we need the three A's uh, to make our schools successful. We have a lot of traction in our schools right now. The numbers are up. Kids are want to come. Tuition is up. Um, and we want to keep it there um, and grow it. So what we've been doing is working on the three A's. Now, everybody kind of assumes that academics is like a given, right? So we've been working on kind of the eye candy, the uh, so, you know, Jeff has been working night and day on sports. Um, we're, we're swag, you know, wildcats everywhere right now. People want, are excited. They want to be a part of that. And the, and the next piece that we're working on right now is the performing arts uh, piece of it. And in order to actually have performing arts is we need a center to do the work. Um, kind of if you build it, they will come. Um, so we're looking at um, putting a performing arts center onto uh, the wing of the high school. We've also identified that there are some entrance ways at both campuses that are both not, not secure um, and not energy efficient. So they should have dual entry, um, not single entries. Um, the, the, um, the high school only has really one entry, which is front. So we're looking at putting a dual entry in the back, which would be convenient for the kids. And over at the middle school here, we have the, the main entrance, which is only a single, I mean, you, can literally see the air flow through the doors um, if you're there tonight, and do a little bit of stuff around the elementary school. And then we have also um, identified um, to do some ventilation in the library. I don't think, that, are we still doing the cafeteria one, or were we just kind of, I think we're just gonna push the library one at this point. Um, and, and, and then we have other things that we want to continue to build upon, and that's why we're saving money for later dates. Um, and like you said, we're trying to leverage that money. Now some, some cool things we have already for the, um, for the bond vote is, you know, we're not gonna be going to the voters asking for the total amount of the bond. We, we have gotten um, some substantial amount of um, people that have donated money um, and we'll have some match money. So we're looking at, at not just asking the taxpayers for everything, that we have some really significant donors that, that want to see this happen. And we plan on leveraging some of this money towards that project. And then save some of this money for our future, you know, all the windows need to replace at some point. You know, we got to do a uh, boiler replacement over in South Royalton. And then there's just all the other things that we want to do. There's parking lot paving and um, different things like that. So I think, you know, short term sighted, you know, taking the $900,000 and buying down the tax rate works for people. But if you really want to continue to invest in, in the school, we have to be a long-term thinker. We have to save this money. This money, we're not going to be seeing many more budgets going forward where we say, hey, we got another $900,000. Like, that money is drying up. It, and that's some of the reasons why, why schools are in trouble right now across the state of Vermont with that, you know, 127. Some of it is the um, the... The revenue sharing piece of it, but some of it is that they grew their budgets. I mean, their budgets are grown. Now they got to make the the big boy um, decision, and should we start cutting it now? So. So 
then Article 12 is <coughs> actually your Australian ballot article. So that is your election of members for the school board of directors. There are four, two seats. I don't know why I got four there. I got to fix that. Um, there are two seats open. There's a Royalton uh, one director for three years, which Peggy Ainsworth is on the ballot for. And then Bethel director, which there wasn't any petitions submitted. So for that, you're going to vote by Australian ballot, and that's going to be on Tuesday, March 5th, beginning at 8 and ending at 7. And that's handled at both campuses, depending on which town you reside in. Um, and that will be at the Bethel Small Gym and then the Royalton um, Gym. And then you can also um, request absentee ballots from your individual town clerks. Royalton Small Gym. Sorry, Royalton Small yep. Gym. Yes. Our gym is small. I always twist those two around. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for pointing that out. I just... Yeah, and just a reminder, folks, that um, the vote on all the other articles, other than those Australian that Australian ballot article, is the night before here in Bethel. Uh, we are providing dinner prior to the vote at five, and child care will be provided too that evening. Um, at 6 for the annual meeting on that Monday night. Right. Questions? Any questions at the board level in regards to the budget? Um, we can probably handle any type of public questions under the public comment period. So uh, if everybody's good with the uh, agenda item number four, we'll get five, which is public comment. So we'll open it up to public comment. I can't really see how many people are on, but typically, depending on how many people want to participate, we'll uh, you know try to keep it in the three to five minutes per person. If there's not as many people, we can expand a little bit. Someone raised their hand. I don't. Was that in the book? I not? do not believe it's been added into the online platform. But the presentation um, itself is not. Kathleen, yeah, the um, that particular slide, I'm not certain whether that was in your mail or not. But it, no. it is on our website, and it'll be in our presentations as we move forward. Is this, is this it? Yes, it is. It oh, is yeah, it. Yeah. It's right. page 22 of your mailer. <laughs> I was thinking of printed board materials. But it's not color. It's not a color. It's not color. Mm. And if you want the color version, it's right on the website <laughs> at WRVSU, and it's under Act 127. It's a tab. Okay. Anybody else? It's usually easiest just to throw your hand up. If for some reason, if you're like me and can't find the hand button, then you can unmute yourself and Kathleen just just say your name your if you unmute. Hand up. I, uh, Tammy? Hi, can you hear me okay? okay? You get an echo, but yes. Is that any better? I think so. Okay. Um, the $900,000 you mentioned, where is that on this slide? On what side? On the slides that we're talking about, that was uh, that was number. Well, it was talked about as article number nine, which I don't know what page it is. Um, article number nine, which also there was a slide, slide that says capital projects reserve fund. Yep. Nineteen and twenty. So nineteen and twenty. Um, so the capital okay. projects reserve fund kind of shows the money to date that has been in or out. Um, as well as the the nine hundred thousand that under Article Nine that we're looking at adding to the capital reserve fund. So if it gets added to the capital fund, what happens with it after that? So, so like we were uh, like I was trying uh, to discuss, where the the idea behind that is we're looking at we have definitely definitely um, a bunch of infrastructure projects that we are currently looking to do and uh, there was a a short sheet that said future facility work I don't know what page that was towards the end um, so those are projects that we're looking to do 
And what we would do is we'd, we'd put this money aside in our capital fund project, and then when we have the opportunity to best leverage those funds towards, um, you know, we're looking for grants, we're looking for uh, matching money that might come from the Department of Education um, or, or outside funds. Um, or, or in the case of the Performing Arts Lab, um, we have um, people that are looking at donating funds towards that project. So however we can best uh, leverage funds for projects. So Veronica continues to get used when we're talking about these budgets is a word called leverage. You've used it multiple times in your sentences. What exactly are we leveraging? So we're, so I, I guess the, instead of going out and paying 100% for a project for us to do, so I'm just going to make it up. Let's say Let's say we could replace all the windows in the Bethel campus for a million dollars. Instead of us going out there and just spending a million dollars on the windows out of our capital reserve fund for Bethel, we're going, we have our feelers out there to see, are there grants out there for window replacement? Um, every once in a while, Jamie in the, uh, the educational department has money, ESSER funds, <coughs> things that potentially can be used for some projects. Um, rather than spend 100% of our local money, we look to you know, leverage that. So can we, you know, can we find somebody that is going to pay 50% of that? So then we only have to pay 50% of it. Okay. Can we leverage means we're going to use the Nope. And uh, Tammy, we are rolling out capital um, deferred maintenance and preventative maintenance plans here in the next month that will capture all that. But, um, you know, easily that one slide, like for an example, we've been quoted that just replacing the windows in Royalton is a million dollars. But we will be we'll be rolling out prior to town meeting there'll be drafted plans around our um, deferred maintenance uh, needs and um, dollar figures associated with those. So the good news is when we ask you to vote on that 900,000, you'll have those plans that the board will be able to share as well. And, and one, good one good example, Tammy, that we have used this year, when, you know, when we talk about leveraging, leveraging funds, I guess would be the word, is the $1.6 million with the work that we did at the Bethel campus and the Royalton campus, we ended up contributing 181000 towards that. So uh, rather than us paying the whole full one, uh, $1.6 million, we paid 181000 towards that $1.6 million. And, and the remainder of that money came through uh, grants, matching money, um, some education money. Performance contracts. Yeah, so... Um, just to chime in real quick. Sorry, Tammy. Um, so just to clarify a little bit, the $900,000 is surplus from last year's budget. So the voters had approved, um, I don't remember the exact number, but you know, somewhere around a net $12 million. So like $13 million of spending with $1 million of revenue, somewhere around there. And in the end, we had more revenue than we were expecting. And lower expenses than we were expecting. So we had $900,000 left over. By law, we either have to put that money aside and save it for later or use it to lower the tax rate this year. We are suggesting that rather than using it to lower the tax rate this year, we put it aside because we know we have these large capital expenses coming up. And when we say the capital, res um, capital improvement fund, that's just a renamed building reserve fund. It always used to be called the building reserve fund. <laughs> When we combined the Bethel and the Royalton building reserve funds, we made it a capital improvement fund because it's a little more flexible with what we can use it for. You would think I'd be familiar with the words you all are using. Um, so deferred maintenance and capital maintenance. Do those show up on that slide of summary things? Well, so these are projects that we know that we have, but we haven't you know, gone out and gotten bids on them or anything yet. We're in the process of doing that. So, okay, let me you know, the, we... <coughs> Whoever's driving 
driving the slides. Can you go back to that summary slide sheet? I think it's the next slide, yeah. This, mm, slide 21. This future facilities work, is this the deferred maintenance and the capital maintenance that was mentioned? It's part of it. There's more to it than that, but it's part of it. And those are some of the priorities in the next upcoming years. Yeah, this is kind of the most pressing things that we're expecting to do in the immediate future. There's going to also be other things that come up going forward. Okay. Somebody else had their hand raised. Uh, well, I think that was Andrew. Um, is there anybody else uh, that has a public comment? <coughs> Okay, hearing none. We'll move on from public comment. Um, is there anything else to be taken up with the board this evening? Not until our regular meeting. Not until the regular meeting. <laughs> All right. Do we need to adjourn that meeting to start yeah, we adjourn this <laughs> one? Start the other okay, one. so we'll just need a motion to adjourn the informational meeting for the budget to join the regular um, school board meeting. So, so <laughs> second. Okay, moved by Peggy and second by Nancy. They were fighting for it. All right. All in favor? Aye. Okay, aye. Rodney, aye. aye. Okay. All right. Thank you all. Thank you.